courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's post-trade deadline, and uh, the Flames have come off of a terrible road trip. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, I think this is going to be a weekend we want to forget about. Yeah, it was not a good slate of games for the Flames. Let's rewind. I need one of those sounds like you saw on a 90s TV show. Let's talk about the last home game. We'll work our way down this list chronologically, and then we can talk about everything else that happened around the deadline and uh, some of the new players and that sort of thing. So the last home game, the Calgary Flames played the Seattle Kraken in the Dome, and the Flames ended up falling 4-2 to two to the Kraken here. Grubauer made 35 saves as the Kraken ended the Flames' five-game winning streak. What were your thoughts on this game? I thought that the Flames played adequately in this one, but uh, Grubauer was definitely the difference. Um, when they went down 3-1 to one early in the third period, I thought the Flames showed a lot of resiliency in trying to come back. They drew within one and then just kept making turnover after turnover once it was 3-2. to two. Yeah, the turnovers kind of led... killed them in, in that last period. Yeah, and that led to the 4-2 McCann shorthanded goal, and that was the ball game. Yeah, uh, good to see Kuzmenko get two goals here. I mean, we've kind of been up and down on him, and I think the team has too since he came in. Yeah, and he's going to basically be your very inconsistent uh, player who can produce when he's on. And it, it, the guy that he reminds me the most of is in terms of production is kind of like Christian who's alias where, you know, when he's on, you know, he'll throw up three or four points and then be virtually invisible <laughs> when he's not. There's a blast from the past, Christian Salius. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think you summed it up well here. I thought Grubauer looked really good. I thought the Flames started to come back, but there was just far too many turnovers and some sloppy play there in the third. I mean, when they drew three to two, I thought to myself, they could probably, if they wanted to, there's lots of time left. They could probably tie this one up or even take this one over, um, but it wasn't to be Yeah, so. then it was just turnover after turnover at that point, and um, then uh, a whole bunch of nonsense happened, and yeah, <laughs> the game went off the rails. It's a good way to say it. And then the Flames went on the road after that at a couple days well, off. I just want to mention the, the Pospisil thing. That's oh, sure. Was, yeah. You know, and I think him getting suspended three games for his hit on Vince Dunn was appropriate. Yeah, I think um, that was an... I, you, you never want to see your home team guys get suspended, but I think it was the right discipline for the action. Yeah, and to be fair, Dunn spent a long time staring at the glass um, before the hit and then you know he did put himself in a very vulnerable position that said you know it, it's also on Pospisil to recognize and hold up um, with him just standing there looking at the boards and not following through on the hit and you know it it was a bad play by Dunn uh, for putting himself in the bad spot, but it was a worse play by Pospisil for following through without stopping. This sort of reminds me of when Kachuk was a young player, and he would often, I would say, be physical for the sake of being physical, not being physical for the sake of, I guess, progressing the game for his team, if that makes sense. And I feel like Pospisil's at that spot too. I think he's kind of been told he should be physical at this point, or that's keeping him in the lineup. And because of that, I feel like sometimes he's... And I think this is a great idea. Maybe taking it a little too far that he doesn't need to. Yeah, and there's just a level of recklessness where, you know, whether it's like punching Marchand in the face a couple weeks ago or this hit on Dunn where you're crossing the line, not necessarily by a huge amount, but it's enough where the league needs to get involved. And, um, you know, hopefully he can walk that line a little bit better than he has. Yeah, and I'm hoping that after, you know, doing that once or twice, the team will have a discussion with them too and, you know, kind of tell them, hey, this is what we're expecting here. Well, and you also have to figure that he is a rookie and it takes time to adjust to the NHL level game and, you know, he's either going to figure it out or he's going to get hurt himself as teams retaliate against him specifically. Yeah, I think a rookie and also a rookie who... 
came in without a lot of, without a clear identity as to who he was going to be. And I think we see those kind of rookies where it's like, okay, I don't know who I am, so I'm going to try some different, you know, styles of play to see what keeps me in the lineup. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. You know, and I, I, you know, I think he was a guy who was brought in to do that kind of thing. Yeah, and he's been very effective throughout the season. It's just, um, you know, as he grows and matures as a player, he needs to figure out that kind of line and, you know, to look to his line mate, Nazem Kadri, when he came into the league, he was very much the same reckless, overly physical, crossing the line type player. And then he's emerged as a very well-rounded player. And, you know, if there's anybody that'll help Pospisil learn how to walk that line properly, it'll be Kadri. It's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens there. I think that, you know, Postles, I think, established himself as a pest in the league, and I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think, you know, you got to know when to hold him and when to fold him, and I think sometimes he's not known when to fold him. Yeah. And that's all part of the learning process. Exactly. Well, now the Flames have gone on the road, as you mentioned, without Postel, um, going on a three-game road trip, probably the hardest road trip in the Eastern Conference, I'd say, of Tampa Bay, Florida, Carolina. Uh, the Flames go into Tampa Bay the day before the trade deadline. They've won six and seven, and Sharon Govich gets a career high four points in a game in this one. Calgary beat the Lightning six to three. And you know, as much as we probably shouldn't care about the Lightning, it's I mean, there's still I think always that, always nice to beat the Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah, I think both because they're a good team, and also after '04, we're celebrating the 20 years of that now. I think it's – and they've won both games this year. They won 4-2 to two on uh, December 16th, 6-3 March, March 7th. So that was, a, that was a good feeling. Yep, I agree. And the Flames dominated the game by and large um, right from the get-go. And the Flames seem to have Vasilevsky's number for whatever reason. Um, a lot of games against him we tend to do well. So that's always nice. And – not much to say other than uh, congrats to Peltier for getting his first of the season and Joel Hanley in his Flames debut getting his first point as well on the Peltier goal. Yeah, and uh, like you said, Peltier gets a goal. Dryden Hunt gets his second of the year. Like Dryden Hunt's not a, a guy who's going to score a whole lot. So the fact that he is, I think, is nice and getting him on the board. But, you know, four points in the game is hard to do for anybody. Any, um, you know, any player works hard to even get three, much less four. This is a really impressive game by Sharon Govich. Yeah, for sure. And he was all over it. Like, he looked like he was doing everything in this game. Yeah, and he's been on a tear. And that continues through the next two games as well. Yeah, I would say, you know, I would say on the weekend, Sharon Govich was probably the flame that looked the best. This was the last game, I would say, with maybe a full defensive core. We saw Hannafin moved after this game. We'll come back and talk about that trade a little bit later. The day after the trade deadline, the Flames take on the Florida Panthers, end up losing a matinee game here 5-1. to one. This was ugly. Yeah, Daniel Miramanoff made his Flames debut in this contest, and... Uh, that's about the only redeeming thing to say about the game. It was not a good performance. I'm trying to even think of, I guess, one good thing to say here. Like, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. This, this looked like the Flames were not ready to go at all. No, and it's like here's a here's a pass to the other team's forward, and another one, and another one, Again, and another Sh one. You know, Sharon Govich gets the only Flames goal here. I would say maybe the the guy that we saw working the hardest in that one. Yeah, and the Anderson Weger pairing was absolutely atrocious. Uh, Weger uh, finished a minus four on the night, and just yeah, nobody was doing anything effectively on the de defensive side of things. And I, a lot of credit to Anthony Stolarz. He had a lot of good saves in the first period, uh, which frustrated the Flames. And I think that... Yeah, he, he had some good saves, but I didn't think that he looked fantastic. No, but like the Flames could have been up 1 or 2 nothing heading into the second period. And the Flames game probably goes a different route if you know they had scored on one of those chances. But... 
Yeah, then the wheels fell off the wagon entirely and then crashed and then burned. <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, like there's no scoring in the first. It was 4-1 by the end of the second. And at that point, I think we all knew how this game was going. Yeah, not good. Then in the next one uh, with Carolina, the Flames left their media team in Florida. <laughs> And the they, rest of the team didn't really seem to join. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the Flames left a lot of stuff. I mean, in even in Tampa Bay, like they didn't seem ready to go after that Tampa game. Um, the next night, Calgary plays again in Carolina. 7-2 is the final score. And when I looked at this, it's like this shows, I think, uh, you can't blame this on the defense. Even though the Flames, I don't think, have a full defensive group. The forwards look like they were standing around watching for most of the time. This just well, the shots, like, after the first 17 minutes, I think were 16 to nothing. So that kind of indicates how good your effort's going <laughs> when, yeah, like, not not good at all. Um, they only managed 20 shots in the game uh, to Carolina's 40. And, yeah, I can't blame Vladar on really any of the goals. It's... He got left hung out to dry on that one. Yeah, Vladar was in net for this the second part of this back to back, and like you said, forty to twenty shots. But you know, even the Flames twenty shots here. I, I looking at them, I don't think that there was really that many good shots in this one. No, and like even the second goal by Sharon Govich was Anderson screwing the puck and base up in the corner and passing it to him for a wide open net like it was not even a normal legitimate chance that you know <laughs> you get a goal on it was a dumb luck kind of thing and once again Sharon Govich on the board gets his 27th of the year yeah um, a career high for him in points and good for him on a soon to be 30 goal season yeah he will definitely get I think 30 goals yeah and not much to say about how those two games ended up. Just, how would you say? It, it looks like the team's kind of packing it in for next year. And it, you know, especially with how, like, the team as a whole is playing. Like, there's, you know, if they continue to play like this, they might get two or three more wins the rest of the way. Level of not good execution at all. <laughs> Well, right now, the Calgary Flames sits fifth in the wildcard race in the West. Uh, they have now played 64 games. They have 31 wins. They have 28 losses and five overtime losses for a total of uh, 67 points, which puts them tied with St. Louis and Seattle. Seattle's fourth, St. Louis is sixth. Arizona's 57 points, so they're way down there, 10 points difference. And Minnesota in third, 69th, and the two teams, or 69 points, sorry. And then uh, Vegas and Nashville who hold down the wildcard spots at 75 and 78. So, you know, the Flames, like you said, not looking good so far. Um, they're on a two game losing streak. We'll we'll talk about this as we get further uh, into our discussion, and once we talk about all the changes, if we think that they'll make their playoff team. But right now, it's looking like they're going to need about I would say seventy percent of their games as wins to make it. Yeah, and the, there's realistically no shot at that happening. Like they'd have to win probably fourteen or fifteen of their remaining games to even have a chance, and realistically. Like, that's just not going to happen. Nope. Like, they're, they're eight points behind uh, the Los Angeles Kings with 18 games to go. Like, that, it, you're done. Like, there's no way. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's come back to that idea. Let's talk about the moves that were made this week, and we'll kind of go in chronological order. Let's start with the Joel Hanley move. The Calgary Flames claimed 32-year-old defenseman Joel Hanley off waivers from Dallas. He's in the first year of a two-year deal with a 780... Yeah, so basically the Tanev trade part two. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to look at it. Um, he's in the first year of a two-year deal with uh, 787,500 cap hits, so a very manageable cap hit here for a 32-year-old. Kind of odd to see a guy with a couple years on their deal taken, but you can tell the Flames... I mean, this is a guy that you either, at that kind of hit, have on your roster next year or he becomes your AHL veteran. 
Yeah, exactly. He's your next Dennis Gilbert, Jordan Osterley guy. Um, fits in as your number six, seven for next year. He's a cheap cap hit. And I think he's, I think he's a perfectly reasonable number seven. Yeah, exactly. He can fit in as the number six. He can fit in as the number seven and just, you know, eat some minutes without being terrible. You know, uh, just your prototypical sixth defenseman. Yeah. And he was that for Dallas too. And he he could play on the second pairing. Uh, if there was injuries, but you know, it, it serviceable and, and that's, for a, I guess for a team that is probably retooling, rebuilding, whatever you want to say, he'll be a just fine piece on the blue line there. Yeah. And sometimes you don't need flash. You just need somebody who can eat some minutes yep. and not be a dumpster fire. And you know, like we've seen that at times from uh, some players like Jordan Osterley, who's been absolutely terrible for this team. Um, you know, and if he can just continue to provide serviceable six, seven minutes for next year, that's perfect. Yeah. And, you know, I think we've seen Osterley, we've seen in the past other sort of veterans brought in. Um, I think the Flames like that idea of sort of having a veteran guy. And I don't think it's a bad idea as a number seven, a serviceable veteran. And they were looking for Osterley to be that. But you're right. This becomes Jordan Osterley's spot next year is taken by Hanley. That sort of 32-year-old that you know is not going to get any better. And you can c- call into service when you need them. And they're good enough. Yeah. And if he regresses at all, then the Wranglers get a good veteran defenseman to help all the young guys that are down there. Or if you lose them on waivers, you didn't lose anything. I was looking at, you want to at least get what you paid for them. And if we claim them off waivers and we lose them on waivers, it's net, 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 net zero. zero. Yeah. Um, for those that might be looking for him, cause there's a lot of new guys. Joel Hanley's wearing number 44 on the blue line right now. And Matt seen the Hanley pickup. This is now three guys in a year that Craig Conroy has acquired off waivers. He's brought in AJ Greer. He's brought in uh, Braden Pacall. And now he's brought in Joel Hanley on waivers where I think if we take, I mean, yes, he lost two guys as well. He lost uh, a defenseman, a forward. We, we talked about Rajichka in the past. Um, but I think that if you look back at Tre living, like, you know, I think maybe one of Tre living's biggest uh, losses was Valimaki on waivers it seems like a very different approach to waivers. The Flames rarely ever picked a guy up before, and now it seems like Conroy's using this as a way to get cheap, free depth. Well, and you look at the t- teams that uh, they snagged guys off of. One was from Boston, one was from Vegas, and one was from Dallas. Well, those are three of the elitest of the elite teams in the NHL, and with those guys being like their seventh defenseman or 13th forward, you know, like they have to be at a certain level to be players on that team in the first place. And so you're getting somebody who's has more upside or ability than your typical waiver uh, pickup and the flames needing just some bodies to fill out some depth roles in this team. Like all three of those players have played admirably for this team since they've been here. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, with the Greer move at the beginning of the season, it's like the flames knew what they needed in that position or what they wanted there. And they saw it and went and grabbed it. Yep. And they've missed him since he's been injured. And, um, you know, and that's what you want is to make enough of a mark on the team where if you get injured, you know, you're actually missed from the lineup. And just speaking of waivers and being missed while we're talking about it, we talked previously about um, Phillips getting getting waived and sent to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh waived him again, and he ended up going back to Washington, which is kind of crazy. You never see that. Yeah, because they had the first right of refusal. Yeah. The, the last time uh, I can recall was actually um, also involved Washington. Uh, New Jersey waived Alex Yerbaum. Uh, to uh, and he went to Washington, and then Washington waved him, and he went back to New Jersey. Nice, but that was like eight years ago. So yeah, it's yeah, it's it doesn't crazy happen. To think about. T- yeah, it doesn't happen too often. So they pick up Hanley, um, and then I guess the next big thing to talk about is uh, the Noah Hannafin trade done just before the trade deadline. Um, this was a trade that came. This was before the Tampa deal, I th- or before the Tampa game, right? Yeah. 
yeah, I'm 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 f- losing my timeline this week. Um, before the Temba deal, they traded Noah Hannafin. There's a lot of talk about where Hannafin might be going. The Flames end up trading him to the Vegas Golden Knights. In exchange, they received Daniil Miramanov, a conditional 2025 first round pick and a conditional 2025 third round pick. We know one of the conditions already on that. So in the event that Vegas possesses their own first round choice in the 2025 draft on this year's trade deadline, um, and that pick is not a top 10 pick in the 2025 draft, Vegas shall give the Flames their first round pick. If not, they give the Flames their 2026 first round pick. When I read the wording on that, I thought to myself, they're up to something. Like Yeah, and then they acquired Tomas Hurdle. Exactly. Uh, from San Jose, and so the Flames will receive the 2026, the 2026 Yeah, but just the way it was worded, I'm like, huh, that pick is in play for something else. Which makes entire sense. And, you know, good on Vegas for, you know, keeping on trying to win every year. And when they fall, they're going to really hit the ground hard. But, you know, they haven't yet, so good for them. It comes for everybody. Yep. Um, and then the other pick, and this is, I, I don't think I've ever seen a, or that I can remember a condition like this. In the event Vegas advances to the second round of the 2024 playoffs, Vegas shall convey their second round pick in 2025 to the Flames in lieu of the 2024 third rounder. So, like, usually we see it's based on winning the finals or winning your conference. I can't remember the last time we saw a condition at the deadline of just win a round. Yeah. And realistically, uh, you know, it, that had to be put in place just because um, Hannafin has yet to sign a contract with them. So, but see, that's what I expected. That's kind of what I expected the condition would be is based on a contract, not so much about winning a round. Yeah. And realistically, getting a second round pick is likely because uh, Vegas is such a deep team that uh, they're going to be a very hard out in the first round. And so, if the Flames can get a second round pick next year for this trade that works a lot in our favor the calgary flames retained 50 percent of hannafin's contract um vegas only picking up 25 percent of it's what who philly who's the broker on this one yeah it was philly philly that's what i thought is taking 25 percent daniel daniel miramanov signed immediately a two-year deal with the flames at 2.5 million so 1.25 million a year for a guy who i think can be in their top six is not a bad not a bad deal there so with all that said, Matt, what do you think of the return for the Flames? Um, looking back to like Philip Ronick uh, with uh, Detroit going to Vancouver last year, he returned to first and a second. And, you know, you look at Hannafin and, you know, he basically got a first, a second plus, you know, a depth defenseman. You know, the return's about the same. And their impact in the lineups about the same so i don't really mind the return so much uh, i like that miramanov has a blister of a slap shot and he's relatively untested and even though he's 26 like he's barely played any hockey in the last two and a half years but he's also had a bad knee injury yeah and it's one of those where if you can get somebody who has a blistering slap shot and you can actually get him to round out the rest of his game, then you have a really good power play option for your team. Um, he used to be a forward. Uh, actually played with Peltier in uh, juniors briefly. That's kind of weird too. And and when I heard that, I thought, Matt's going to love this guy because you always want to convert our defensemen to forwards. Yeah. So we got somebody on the reverse end of it. Uh, we've Brent got a new Brent Burns type and, uh, yeah, we'll see. And it's a good gamble. And this is the type of thing that teams that are rebuilding and retooling need to do is find depth guys that are on good teams. Like they did with Sharon Govich from New Jersey that have elite skills and hope that they can round out the rest of their package that they have. And if that's happens then great you have a top four defenseman for the next two years at like 1.25 and then yeah you can likely re-sign him for a long time after that and like you said he has a he had a bad knee injury or you said he hadn't played much he had a bad knee injury i said because you know that's taken him out of lineup but even if we look at his ahl numbers i know they're very different leagues 2021 22 he played 53 games and had 40 points as a defenseman 
that's pretty impressive. And then last year, or sorry, 2022, 2023, 31 points, or 31 games, 22 points. And then last year only played five games there. Oh, no, this year it only played five games there and had six points. So, you know, this is a guy who's putting up pretty good points at the American League level. Yeah, and realistically, like, once he um, gets some time and, like, actual practice time, like, I kind of throw out the two games on the weekend for all the new people just because of the fact that, like, there's literally no time to practice a new system. And, oh, yeah, you're getting dropped in against two of the best teams in the league. Have fun. It's one of those where they need to figure out... um, how to incorporate his tool set into the lineup. And I would not be shocked if he even got uh, some time on PP1 uh, for the team to because of his slap shot. Yeah, I could, I could very well see that. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, this guy didn't play a lot and that sort of thing. Yes, he's been hurt, but he was also really a 7-8 behind a very deep Vegas defense. And I think, you know, if you give him the time, you're going to see him mature very quickly. Yeah. And this is what rebuilding and retooling teams need to do is pick off depth talent from high end teams. Like, the, like they cannot, Vegas cannot afford to have Miramanov figure things out at the NHL level. And, you know, he would easily be claimed off of waivers if they tried to wave him down. So they're kind of just stuck having him in the press box until somebody else gets hurt and it sucks for Miramanov because he can't actually establish himself or establish any rhythm until he gets moved to a team like us where we can give him that runway to figure things out. Miramanov's wearing number 62 for the Flames if you're looking for him. You know, if Brian Burke was still in town, this back end he would hate because he didn't want anyone wearing higher than 35. We have 52, 58, 94, 44, 62. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> he, he would he would hate this group. The only guy he'd like is Anderson because he's four. Yeah. Um, I'm happy with this return. Like I think that if if Hannafin got signed to a, an eight year, like a sign and trade, or even a seven year, and somebody were to sign him right after that, I think he would have got a lot more for the rental price that they're paying. I wouldn't have expected much more than this. The first and the second was kind of what I was thinking the high end was going to be, and I think it'll end up being a first and a second. Um, I don't know that at first I thought that the Flames should have got something for moving down to 2026 with the pick, but you know, in the end, I don't think that's much of a, a change for them. And I think that really the key piece here might end up being Miramanov. Like, you know, I think we might look back at this in two years and go, wow, he was a really good presence for the Flames. I can't believe he was almost the toss in. Yeah. And it's one of those things where being able to space out your picks as well, uh, helps because usually like if a team has 12 or 13 draft picks in a year there's a whole bunch of guys that just tend to miss due to the fact that like there's just not enough space in the organization to accommodate that many people and so being able to layer this so that way you're getting x number of picks this year next year and the year after you know it allows uh, everybody to evolve at the st- a correct pace instead of trying to rush too many people in at the same time. Yeah. This year, the flames have two firsts. They have theirs and Vancouver's. They have two seconds. Theirs in Dallas is two thirds, potentially theirs in Vegas, um, two fourths. There's New Jersey, no fifth, a sixth, and no seventh next year. They have the Florida first rounder potentially, but not theirs. They have a second, a third, maybe another second, depending on what happens here. Uh, no fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh. And then in 2026, they have theirs in Vegas. And their second, theirs in Vancouver's third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth, and a seventh. So, yeah, like you said, they're evenly spaced out here. Yeah, and that allows this team, especially like as we move into like next year's draft or this year's draft and next year's trade deadline, as the retool keeps happening, that, you know, like you can phase out players that – you know, like next year you're going to see likely if they don't re-sign Manjapane and Kuzmenko moved out and any of the other UFAs moved out and, you know, keep turning over the roster basically for whatever you can get. And, and it also gives you currency, like having multiple yes. firsts. You know, we've saw what Tree Living could do with the first, and obviously the team's going to go into a very different direction now, but whether that's a first to trade up or a first to trade out, 
um, you know, it, it gives them some other currency. Yeah, or just making the pick and getting another really high end prospect. Yep. Like any which way, like it's. And we saw the, the tree like to trade down, and I think if you have multiple firsts, you also have more likelihood of maybe trading down and getting another asset. Yeah, well, it also depends on, uh, like, especially with the Flames and like all the picks that they have in the top four rounds, they might not necessarily need to do that this year. But they uh, might not need to. But if somebody comes, you know, it's sort of like the Peltier deal. They trade down twice and still said they got the guy they wanted. Uh, that was Zari, but yes. There you go. I knew it was one of the guys in the yeah. team. Yeah, but yeah, I agree. It, it's just still be interesting to see uh, at the draft. It'll be very much a flames focused event so before we move on here um interesting if you want to read it go take a look at the article on sportsnet by eric francis that came out today the 11th of march he talked to noah hannafin in his hotel room in vegas and talked to hannafin kind of about the way things ended in calgary and hannafin said and i'll quote here i was never holding the flames hostage unquote that was one of the more difficult things to hear towards the end because I personally felt I was never doing that. Talking to Connie, I don't think either side felt that, unquote. So it's a really interesting read here that, you know what, um, maybe it wasn't the way that things were portrayed in the media. We heard in the last couple of days there that, you know, Hannafin's agent said they'd only let him be traded to one team and kind of, and, you know, sort of hijacking that. And Hannafin does remind us here, quote, I had an eight team, no trade list. So I was never going to be able to say no. I felt I should give Calgary a list of teams I would sign with. And then it, and, and then it got out there. I was holding the team hostage and would only sign with one team. I wasn't ever going to sign an extension just anywhere in the league. I don't think any NHL players should do that unquote. And hearing that from Hannafin, that reminds me a lot of um, Kachuk, right? Kachuk told the team, Hey, I don't want to come back. Here's a list of places. I will go, go do a deal with one of those teams. Yeah, and it, it's unfortunate that um, he was portrayed as being holding the team hostage. It just also did not help that like the teams that he wanted to go to were also teams that had pretty much sweet F all for prospect or draft picks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like Tampa was the team that apparently was closest to acquiring Hannafin before Vegas stepped in and uh you know um like their prospect pool is uh, abysmal at best well, and I think most of the top teams are right because they trade all their all their top picks yeah and while the Flames are in a good position where they they can wait two years on Vegas's first round pick it also doesn't help you know, that you have to wait for two years and then like probably another three years for that pick to develop. See, when, when the trade first got made, I thought to myself, if we're going to wait two years, we should almost get something else. Like we get a fifth if you make us wait. Yeah, but it, it's fine that it is. It's just, you know, it, it's good for the long term. And, you, you know, the, the only thing I look at is there's no protection on that 2026 pick. And you mentioned it earlier, when Vegas blows up, they're going to blow up hard. And I think they might be out of the playoff picture by 2026. Well, you got to figure that like Mark Stone keeps falling apart. Uh, Jack Eichel keeps falling apart. And like a bunch of their other guys are in their they really early don't to have mid thirties. Like, yeah. Uh, like when they hit that wall, like they're going to. And the be fact they're terrible. a wild card team this year, like they've been very dominant in the last couple of years, but they fall into a wild card spot, which I think says something too. Yeah, and like while Hurdle will help them and Hannafin will help them, like, and we don't even it, know if Hannafin's sticking around. No, and it, it's like if Hannafin goes away, like th that's gonna be hard, you know, because like uh, Alec Martinez is uh, gonna be a free agent at the end of the year, and you know, like their their depth on their defense, like if they don't get Hannafin under de uh, contract, like they're gonna be struggling on their defense so the fact that it's not protected you know like the flames could end up with a top 10 pick from that yeah and, and i think they wouldn't in 2025 but give no. it you know give it three drafts and i think that could end up being a really good pick for the flames yep and how often do you see a team that acquires a pick and then has two picks in the top 10 yeah and that could very well happen it could easily happen um 
I'll let, I won't go through this whole article, but it does say that Hannafin said that Conroy made one last attempt to sign him a week before the trade, which meant so much to Hannafin. And he goes on to talk a lot about Craig Conroy and how much he meant to him. He's a good man and he's put them in a good spot. Um, so, you know, really to me, complimentary from Hannafin on his way out. And we saw a similar article when Johnny left. I think it was Eric France as well that talked to Johnny and got some thoughts on him and that sort of thing. To me, I hold no ill will against Hannafin. I know the Vegas Knights are in town this week. I know he'll probably get booed, but to me, there's no reason to boo him. I mean, yeah, he's not here. Yeah, he wasn't going to sign, but we got value for him. I, I would, you know, I would boo him if he held the team up like Johnny did or, you know, something like that. But I see no reason to, to boo this guy. Yeah. I know. I agree. Um, like, I personally, you know, won't boo him at all. It's just cost of doing business and he didn't want to sign here and that's Same okay. with all the other ufas yeah. but we got and value and i think that's the important thing is yeah i didn't want to sign here that's okay if you don't want to be here i don't want you here but i think we got good value for him no and like i could see like zadorov and uh lindholm getting booed i don't expect hanev to ever get booed and hanifin might from some people but yeah that's about it Flames made one other deal, um, probably the one most people don't know two about. Two other. Oh, that's, well, yeah, that's true. One, two others. One that probably nobody knows about, and that was a AHL deal, trading winger Emilio Pedersen to Dallas, another trade of Dallas. He seems to have his dance partners here. Vancouver, Dallas, um, picked up centerman, 23-year-old Riley Dam Damiani from the da Texas Wranglers, or the, sorry, the Texas Stars to the Calgary Wranglers. In 53 games this year with Texas, um, we have 23 points for Damiani, and he's played one game with the Wranglers so far. This is a guy I don't expect to ever be in the NHL. This seemed like just addressing a positional need. The Flames need some centers. And I think Emilio Pedersen has been in this organization long enough that he's kind of hit his ceiling, and they know what he is, and I don't think he's an NHLer. Yeah. Well, and that, that's the thing... Um you know the with that move it's certainly for uh the flames uh farm team and bolstering them for a playoff run and getting a center for a winger always helps and damiani is not great uh but neither is Pedersen. Well, i was gonna say neither is Pedersen. seems like a pretty and, fair deal to me yeah i don't think damiani well, ever probably plays for the flames and maybe a cup of coffee but um, yeah. as a fill-in guy. And, well, and same with Pedersen. Like, I, I wouldn't expect him to have played for the Flames very much other than a cup of coffee, and I don't expect him to play with Dallas for more than a cup of coffee. No, I think I think if either guy's playing, it's because you've got some depth issues Major injuries, and some probably yeah. injury issues. Yeah. Not and just, just to your a, NHL. A but... note uh, to uh, Flames fans about um, Grishnikov. Uh, he's apparently playing on the Wranglers' first pairing um, since he's been there, and he's excelling and looking like the best defenseman on the ice. Just because, you know, we're talking stars. This is trades, the defenseman so. that they got back in the Tanev deal. Yeah, this is deal. the guy they got back in the uh, Tanev deal, who's wearing number two for the Wranglers, and Damiani wearing number 11 for the Wranglers. So, you know, I think Cole Schwint was. Cole Schwint's probably the best center down there, maybe Ben Jones. Um, and Schwint's been up and down, so I think this is good to just give you that that extra depth, especially as they're, I think, looking for a Wranglers playoff run. And then one last move, um, maybe as exciting, maybe not as the last one, but the Flames bring in one more guy at the deadline, and this is a very... When I looked at this, I thought this is a very true living move. True living like to give away depth picks for depth defensemen. Uh, the Calgary Flames make a deal with the San Jose Sharks, who are surprisingly active on the deadline. Uh, the Flames bring in Nikita Ohuchik from the San Jose Sharks in exchange for a 2024 fifth-round pick. The Sharks will get the better of the two picks because uh, the Flames have two there. And uh, Ohuchik will wear number 83 for the Flames. He's not on this road trip, but he will rejoin the team when they get back to Calgary. 23-year-old six-foot defenseman. He's played 43 games with the Sharks. He probably never would have played 
43 games if he wasn't with a, a very bad team. And uh, eight points, 44 penalty minutes. This is a, I, I would say this is, this brings some of that grit the Flames probably need on the back end um, after losing D. Simone. Well, and uh, basically, in my mind, uh, it's kind of replacing some of the elements that Zadorov used to bring. And Uhutiak uh, definitely uh, is more of a physical banger type defenseman. And uh, he, uh, uh, is apparently friends with Sharon Govich from their time in New Jersey. Um, he was involved in the Timo Meyer trade from New Jersey to San Jose. That's where they got him from. And, um, yeah, no, and the Flames need to bolster getting defensive defensemen, physical defensemen, offensive defensemen. They've really gone out and, and got a little bit of everything. So they can kind yeah, of shuffle and, the deed based on what they want that night. Well, and especially because of the fact that, um, like, this team's prospect pool over the last few years has basically been draft forwards, draft more forwards, draft all the forwards. Um, and sometimes a goalie. Yeah, that uh, their decor has been rather thin outside of uh, Poirier and Moran. Um, so now, like, they've got about eight or nine different options now that are in that young-ish group that they can pick and choose from and see basically have a infight between all of them and say well hey four spots are available yeah <laughs> after Uyghur and anderson have fun yeah Uyghur <laughs> anderson shillington figure out the rest yeah and you and can... this is a guy i think they could sneak through waivers next year possibly but i actually think he'll make the team uh just because of his profile yeah, I think I think they I think he'll be the number six. Okay. Yeah, I think he'll make the team. I think Mermanov will make the team, and I think Bacall will make the team. Yeah, that would be my And I think Hanley will be your either your floater seven. or your AHL depth guy first call up type. Yep. Uh, that's the way I see it with any of the young guys coming up basically. Like you know, I, I think Poirier is good, but I think missing most of the season you want to keep him in the American League for one year. Yeah, week. unless they're like uh, showing that they're ready like right now then you adjust accordingly but I think for the balance of you know like until January February next year you're gonna likely see Ohotiak, uh, Pahal and Miramanov uh, taking the three bottom spots yeah and I think going into training camp those will be the guys to beat if you want a spot yep so that really rounds out the Flames' moves the deadline. Um, they made one more, I guess, transaction. Um, you thought they might trade Rooney. Kevin Rooney re-signs here. He signs on a one-year, $1.3 million deal. If you listen to Craig Conroy's press conference, he kind of said this Rooney's the Rooney they brought him in to be. And he struggled in his first year. He got hurt. They're seeing what they wanted there. You and I talked about he's almost that Derek Ryan replacement. Um, I think this is a fine deal. For one year, why not? Yeah, exactly. And with him likely going to be healthy all year next year, somebody that you could get like a fifth round pick for the trade deadline if you need to. Yeah, and I think if we look at the players that the Flames, you know, are maybe going to bring up from the farm, I think Rooney is a really good penalty killer. I think he's really good on the fourth line. I don't see a farm replacement for him. I think you could throw a guy in there just to do it. But I think you still need veterans. And, you know, he's 30 right now. He'll be 31 uh, when this contract expires. He knows how to play his role well. I think he's the kind of guy you want to anchor to young players. Exactly. Like the cadre of the fourth line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can have cadre and the kids and, I guess, I don't know, Rooney and the kids. Yeah. Um, and maybe the biggest news of the day for some people was what the Flames didn't do. Jacob Markstrom, still a Calgary Flame here. Matt, I know you were very adamant about moving Markstrom. Do you think the Flames missed out here? Yep, entirely. I, I think it was a bit, like, without knowing the exact parameters of what the return was, you know, like, frankly, you know, I don't see there being much of a market for him in the offseason season as much as there was like right now due to the fact that like in the off season you have three or four guys that will be available like Linus Olmark and 
you know, it, it's going to be tougher to get agency out of uh, Markstrom's deal. Um, and, uh, like, I felt that, you know, like, frankly, it's going to hinder the team a bit during the balance of the regular season and i know it's going to sound bad but like the team does not need to win a ton of games the rest of the way but you're not going to make the you know and it's one of those where the team is going to give up a ton of goals just because the defense is not good at the moment and you know you have basically two-thirds of your defense core learning how to play the system on the fly because Shillington hasn't even been back that long. And, like, that's going to submarine Markstrom's numbers as well. And, you know, it, it, like, it, the whole thing just seems like a poorly thought out uh, decision from the upper management. I don't think that this was Conroy's idea. I think that if... Well, so so things have come out about that since we chatted last, too. And we said that, you know, Markstrom made some comments about upper management. It sounded like it was ownership that maybe wasn't comfortable retaining the money then it came out after that in the media that they were okay to i guess uh new jersey was okay to make the deal not retain the money i'm on the opposite side of you though like i think there might be more of a market in the offseason there's always a team that craps the bed in the playoffs and then goes out and overspends on a goalie and i think i think there might be a couple of those this year yeah, and I do have to say that the way that uh, Fitzgerald in uh, New Jersey ha- and how he handled the whole thing was complete amateur hour, and if I was the owner of the Devils, I would actually strongly be considering firing him in the offseason for how that whole saga went down, especially with where their team is at and needing to be in the playoffs. Yeah, for- and I can't see them wanting to go into next season with Markstrom and Allen. No. So I think they're probably out of that race now. Yeah, and it's just, and you know, like going and getting Jake Allen, it's like, oh, let's get the worst starting goaltender in the entire NHL. Yeah, but that you know, really improves things. Like you know, I mean, when I look at dumb. the when I look at the starters that are available this summer, though, Matt, I mean, Matt Murray, um, Samsonov, Chris Dreger, Jeremy Swayman is going to get re-signed. Capo Kako or Capo Kakinen, um Pavel Francois, like there, there's not a ton of good goalies out there. So I think if you're looking for a, a top end goaltender, you're either looking at maybe Murray or you're gonna have to deal with Calgary. Yeah, or Allmark, and that's about it. Um, yeah, and I don't even. Yeah, but I I would put Allmark in a different level too. Yeah. Like I think if you're a top team, if you're say Vegas and you say we need a goalie, Allmark's probably not the guy you're you're going after. No. Right? So I think there will be those teams. I can see L.A. being one of them. I can see uh, Vegas being one of them. I can potentially see uh, Carolina being one of them who would be willing to move what it took to get Markstrom at the draft and I think could give you a better package in the summer. Yeah. Realistically, though, I think that there is 0% chance that um, Markstrom's a flame next year. I I would agree. You know, like they're just, it makes zero sense for where the team is going. The fact that with their conditional pick going to Montreal, they frankly need to be a bottom 10 team next year. Otherwise, they're going to lose their their draft pick for nothing, basically. Um, and, you know, Florida is going to be good and a playoff team. So you would rather Montreal take the Florida pick instead of ours. So you're, and, you're talking about the weird conditions from the uh, the Monahan from, trade, from the yeah. Monahan trade, yeah. So you know, like it it's, makes it a big deal difference for the Flames uh, to be bad next year, as much as that isn't fun. And you know, the Flames need to find a way to get as many assets for Markstrom, and hopefully, you know, looking at the standings, like. There are a number of good players in this draft. They need to be in the top 10. Uh, currently, they're the 11th place team, and the lower they are, the better. Um, and it Nobody wants to lose uh, or advocates for losing, but you know, being realistic, this team needs to fall as hard as they can uh, without actively doing so just 
for draft pick purposes. I'm not going to read all the conditions because there's conditions and sub conditions. It's the first trade that I think's ever had sub conditions. But essentially, next year, if Calgary's pick is a top ten and Florida's is not a top ten, Montreal will receive Florida's pick. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a bit of origami on that one. <laughs> yeah, it's, Lots the, of it's the first time I've ever seen a sub condition. There's two sub conditions on it. Like it's, it was an interesting deal. And you know, even without that though, like even without the Flames wanting to necessarily get into that bottom ten, and I'm not going to use that word tank because I hate it and I think it's a terrible thing to think of. Why do you want to stay your Markstrom? You're 34 now. You've got a wife. You've got a kid. I think you're probably going to want to go somewhere and settle down. You know, you're not going to want to get traded later when the kids one, two are starting school. Like I think if you're going to make that move and we got to remember, these are people more than just, you know, hockey playing assets. I think from a people perspective, I wouldn't want to move this quickly at the deadline. He has the right not to. I think he and his wife will probably figure out where they want to go in the off season and then be willing to sort of relocate and stay there. Yeah, and realistically, you know, if you're Markstrom, you'd want to go to a Colorado, a Carolina, a Toronto to potentially win a Stanley Cup. Well, that's and, it, yeah. You know, you're looking at Calgary, like, even with Markstrom being as amazing as he has, like, the Flames are still the 11th worst team in the NHL. And he's not and Mika Kippersoff. He's not no. going to put them on his back and play 70 games and get them to the playoffs. No, and then even then, like, that's with the good defensemen that they had that they no longer do. So, like, you know, the Flames are going to be going down in the standings. It's just a matter of how far. And, you know, like, and next year, like, the, we're more than likely going to be in the Columbus, Anaheim, San Jose, Chicago territory more so than, you know, vying for a playoff spot. So... It just sucks, basically, and for him specifically, he's 34. He's going to want to try and win a Stanley Cup at some point. So it, I, I think very similar to what I was saying about Hannafin earlier. You know, he he wants to move on. He doesn't want to be here. If you don't want to be here, we don't want you here. So thank you for giving us a great year this year. And you know, I think it'll be very similar to Jerome. I hate to see him go, but I want to see him win. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you gave like, us some good years. Hey, if you don't want to be here, that's fine. Off you go. We'll get value for you. Give us the off season to figure that out. And we'll we'll put you somewhere where you want to be because he has the right to tell us where he wants to be. So, um, you know, you tell us where you want to be. We'll make it happen. And thanks for the thanks for the good years. Yep. Um, and, you know, as bad as this sounds, if you're Dan Vladar, you got to be excited because you're probably going to get to show if you're a starter or not next year. Yeah. And at least be the starter and... You know, even if your stats aren't good, you know, you can make a name for yourself, even if the Flames are a basement team next year, um, as a guy that's pushing to keep his job for the next year. Yeah, for sure. Matt, I think that pretty much wraps up our post-deadline episode. Before we, we look at the week ahead, is there anything you think that the Flames, besides Marshall, missed out on at the deadline? Well, not really. Like you look at all the UFAs that the team had, save for Shillington, um, they moved on uh, from all of them. They re-signed Marimanov, who they got. They re-signed Rooney, who was a UFA. Uh, Greer is also a UFA, but he's hurt, and he's likely going to be back anyway. So it's one of those where, you know, like Shillington will be re-signed, I'm sure, soon. Um. And, you know, you look at a guy like Manjapane, like, yeah, he makes $6 million. And that, you know, if he was making four, he might have got moved at the deadline. But people don't want to spend $6 million on a second, third line forward for next year. They'd rather Hurdle get got that. got moved. He's making more. I know. But uh, they'd rather wait until next year's trade deadline. And the Flames need roster I, spots I could filled, also so. see, and I'm not saying it, it will happen, but I could see them shock us in the summer and move. If they can find someone who'd want to take on the money or if they're willing to eat half of it, I could see him moving with Markstrom. Yeah, that's possible too. The one thing I was kind of expecting the Flames might have done at the, at the deadline was broker some money, take some money from somebody. But I was surprised how cheap brokering was this year. Like on both Calgary defenseman deals, a team was a broker for about 2 million and only paid a fifth round pick. 
like it almost wasn't worth the cost of being that broker. No. And it's just one of those things where Calgary wasn't really in the spot to do that. Um, they had one spot left that they could have yeah, used. But I think that they were also keeping that open in case Markstrom was going to get moved. And that just never materialized. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for a fifth, I mean, I think they have so many picks. A fifth is the least of our problems right now. But I was yeah. just surprised how, I guess, how cheap it was to, to broker Well, there's a, also a difference between, like, the trade deadline and at the beginning of the year. Like, if they, those brokerages would have happened at the beginning of the year, you're likely talking a first or a second. Yeah, but we've even seen brokerages around the deadline. Um, like, I, I think I'm even thinking back to, like, the DeShane deal and stuff where it, it costs, like, a, a second or third. Yeah. I know. It just depends on the team, basically. Yeah. Um, and I was also. Calgary's just not in that spot right at the moment. I was also surprised how much future asset moved to the deadline. You know, there's very yeah. little player for player. It was a lot of player for futures. Yeah. And realistically, uh, you know, like the Flames, uh, I think, did well by getting guys that can step in kind of like right now for the I team. Agree. Um, because, like, how would you say, like, the Flames have a bunch of NHL-ready forwards, uh, Zari, Peltier, Coronado, but on the blue line, basically, they had nobody. Uh, yeah. Like, Soloviev was kind of the most ready, and maybe Kuznetsov, but even then, like, they're not really, like, full-time NHLers, so getting Ohotiak, uh, Pahal, and uh, Miramanov it gets and guys in getting the younger guys that are in that like 25 or younger range but are nhl ready that you can slot in for the time being see how they turn out and then go on to the uh poriers and more and i like, still the next have year. a feeling the flames will go out and make a free agent sign on the back end quite possible they're gonna have money it, to play with i don't know that they're happy with but with pakal or Mirmanov as a four um so i could see them going out and getting even an older four you know someone who's willing to come in for a couple million just to because he needs a home yeah uh, i think that the free agency will largely depend on what they feel like they're gonna do um if they're just gonna commit to the rebuild they just might not go out and sign anybody um they might just take on somebody's like final year of their contract, like the Monahan trade in reverse. Yep. Um, yeah, I can see that. You know, and that's where you might get one of your defensemen uh, from is literally a cap dump. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, if I look at the top defensemen available, or maybe the ones that might come here, um, Seabrook, Myers, Muzzin. Martinez, Brody, they're all going to find homes. Hannafin, Tanev, Barry, Zaitsev, Klingberg, like they'll all find homes. I could see potentially Matt Dumba coming in. Yeah, but even then, you know, at the it's, point it's where... It's a veteran guy. Yeah, at the point the Flames are at, though, I think that they might just say, well, we'll run with the three guys, the yep, young guys. they might. And, you know, if any of the kids on the farm show that they're better than those guys, great. Yep. I could also yeah. see, you know, if they wanted a guy like Colin Miller, I could see him coming here, a 31-year-old who's serviceable as a four during a rebuild. Yeah. Like, realistically, the team doesn't really need a ton of things right now. I think the, I think like, the next the thing they need spaces, is centerman. Yeah. Like, the spaces that they need are realistically um, guys that – the three guy, younger guys, the runway to actually let them play at the NHL level and see what they actually are as players to then, you know, make their minds up whether to keep or move those guys and, yeah, you know, move on to the next phase of things. I don't know you want to come into next year as Sharon Govich as a, as a centerman, so I think you need to find a centerman to go with Kadri, Backlund, and Rooney. Yeah, and I think that in the... How would you say... Because the Flames are probably going to be just in the retool, rebuild mode next year, I think you're actually going to probably see them just stick with what they've got, uh, even up front. Uh, unless, like, they add somebody through a cap dump. I don't really see... 
Like, Sharon Govich has played rather well this year as a center. So... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think I think Manjapani could be out of here before the season starts. I, th- I don't know that Walker Doer makes the team next year. I think there'll be a few changes on the front end, but yeah. n- not a ton. Yeah, and realistically, I think like the team, like the next centers that this team gets, will be guys that they draft, um, and that might not necessarily be this draft. It might be the next one or the next one after that. Um, where they actually get like the impact centers, but I think for a rebuilding team, having Sh- Sharon Govich as your first line center is perfectly okay. And Zari played center and junior. I could see them try him there this yeah. season as well. Yeah, and he's injured of, right now, but I could see them. Yeah, giving that a plenty shot of time to experiment and see what you have, and like that's all what like next season is is a building year to see what all the young players can do, and you know. Like, as much as, like, Pospisil has been an impact player for this team, like, he could easily walk or do or it where he was great this year and then terrible next year. Um, Is that going to be what we call that now, walk or do or in it? Yes. You know, and... It, should, like, we, walk should we tell him to been... walk his way out of Calgary? <laughs> no. Uh, but, you know, like, Doer has not played well this no. year, and, it, like, his time as an NHLer might be coming to an end. At I the think end the organization the likes him, and I don't think anyone would claim him. I think you'll see him in the AHL again next year. Yeah, I agree. I think everybody has a Walker Doer. I don't think yeah. everybody wants another one. And remember, for those that don't know, if you claim a guy off waivers, you have to keep them in the NHL, or if you try to put them on waivers, like we mentioned with Phillips earlier, the other team gets a chance to claim them back. I think Calgary would claim this guy back. I can't see anybody saying after this season, yeah, I want Walker Dewar on my roster for 82 games. No. So I think he will be back with the Wranglers next year. More um, than likely. Well, I think that wraps up this week for the Flames. You and I did not do well last year per, or last week predicting this this week. Um, I came in saying they'd win in Seattle and Carolina, lose to Tampa Bay and Florida. You thought they'd win Seattle and lose the other three. Well, I got the right amount of wins, just you did. not the right team. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's sort of like that game mastermind, right? Colors, wrong position. Um, yeah, we. I don't. And even though we thought wins on the either of us expected the or losses, I should say. Um, I don't think either of us expected the big losses that we had. No. Like, they really got thumped hard. The the Flames are coming back to Calgary this week. They are on a homestand um, all week. So they're back in Calgary on Tuesday, playing at 7 p.m. against the Colorado Avalanche. Then on Thursday, Noah Hannafin and the Vegas Golden Knights come to town at 7 p.m. start time. And then the early game on Saturday for Hockey Night in Canada, 5 p.m. against the Canadiens. Matt, what are you thinking? Uh, loss, loss, loss. All losses? Yep. Uh, I think they get thumped hard against the Avs and the, the Golden Knights, too. I think they're going to, I think the first couple games are going to be tough. Yeah. Like, I think that they're going to get hammered in the, the two games. <laughs> and probably like a 3 2 type game against uh, Montreal. To round up the Montreal's week. the only one I'm not sure of. Like I think they get their butt handed to them against Colorado, and then they get their butt handed to them against Vegas. I that see- one's more of a toss up, but I, I'm just lending more to the negative on this one. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna go the other way. I'm gonna go. They lose the first two, and they win against Montreal. Okay. I think if they can win a game, that's the one. But it's, I don't know, we're at that point in the season where it's just, it's not looking good anymore. And we talked about it earlier. I think at this point, we can safely say this team's out. Yeah, like there's no way, realistically, at all, um, that this team, you know, you're trying to fit literally four defensemen into your lineup who've never played this system. Like, and we've seen earlier, like it took Uyghur half a year last year to figure things out. And, you know, like some of the other guys, it took a lot, you know, a month or two. And, you know, and to expect four guys to step in and be awesome right from day one. Well, not just learning the system, but I think also getting to a level they're not used to playing at. These are not, you know, three, four or four, five defensemen. No. And like Pahal has been a six, seven. Uh, Miramanov's been a number seven. 
Ohoti X been a number seven, uh, number six with San Jose, and um, Hanley's been a six seven. So, you know, and then all of a sudden they're getting you know a lot more. And minutes I think you're going to see these guys start running a gas because they're not used to playing that many minutes. No, and I think that's part of the reason why they got an extra guy so that way they could throw Gilbert or you know the extra of those guys in there on a nightly basis just to spell off whoever is rusty basically knowing the flames are probably out of this as we've said how do you manage your goaltending this week do you start to give markstrom less stars to give ladar more so you see what you got for next year do you keep running markstrom uh, m- myself personally i i would definitely go to more of a 50 50 split and because frankly, this team needs to figure out if uh, Vladar will cut it for next year, and um, you know, like if you're playing, say, Marks from 15 games or 14 games and four for Vladar the rest of the way, which would be about the appropriate split based off of the first half of, or 60 games. Uh, you know, like that's not enough of a runway to see what Vladar can do for you next year as well, and. Yeah, you know, like there's no way the flames are going up, so it. I think you'll need to see Vladar, and I think you'll see Markstrom a little bit more in the next handful of games. But as like the losses start to pile up, I think you'll start to see Vladar getting a bunch more games. Yeah, I think you have to, especially if you think that you know Markstrom is not going to be here next year, which I agree with. I think you've got to see what you've got in the other guy, and this is the time to do it when it really doesn't matter if he if he doesn't do well. Yeah, and realistically, you know, at the end of, very end of the season, I could see, like, the last game of the season, like, Wolf playing uh, for the one game off. But, you know, like, I, I would expect Markstrom probably to play eight or nine games the rest of the way, uh, Vladar to play most of the rest and one for Wolf at the end. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think this month at least, we'll probably see, I think, Markstrom against the good teams, the Colorado, the Vegas, maybe um, Vancouver. And I think you'll see I think you'll see Markstrom against the good teams, and I think you'll see Vladar against everybody else. Montreal, Washington, um, Chicago, Buffalo. I, I think that's probably the way the coaches will split this because they don't have a back-to-back this month. No, and, you know, looking at – just they only have one more back to back yeah and like most of the games for the rest of this month are against decent teams in the playoffs or in the playoff hunt so i could see like from like now till the four game homestand where it's three good teams in montreal that markstrom gets the three against the good teams and vladar against montreal and then Assuming that oh they, they do lose. have a back to back story they do uh, Vancouver and then Vancouver here and then Buffalo wow that's gonna be a tough road trip going from Calgary to Buffalo no it's the other way around oh, sorry other way around so Vancouver to okay that makes more sense uh but you know like I would expect like Marks from getting three of the next four and then it like balancing out after that where it's more of a fifty fifty split the rest of the way. We'll see, but I think you have to at least go 50-50. You've got to start giving that net to Vladar to see what you've got there because maybe they decide, hey, we got to move both these goalies in the offseason. And well, we- and that's exactly the point. You know, like it, you might end up going and uh, swinging a deal with Toronto because, like, they have Matt Murray as an impending UFA where or Samsonov as also a UFA where you could potentially get – one of those guys included in the trade so that way you have the time to actually negotiate a one-year deal with or two-year deal with whichever of those guys to be a, your filler guy if Ladar does not really stand out either. Exactly. Yep. So I think, you know, I think it's one of those things that we we'll see what happens as they go forward. I think there's a lot of ways this could work and this could happen, but I think that – uh I think that there's, you know, I don't know if there's a right or a wrong, but I think what they do is going to tell us how they plan to move forward. Yeah, and it, it's just one of those where you kind of just have to manage the minutes and give as much opportunities to the younger guys, whether it's the goaltenders or anybody else. And 
how would you say like the rest of the season is basically evaluation for the off season and like what the game plan for next year is. Yeah. And, and you know, there. you mentioned earlier the idea of, um, you mentioned the idea, you know, of playing Wolf for a game. Like we've also seen a lot of injuries for this team this year in goal. And I would not be surprised if we get at least one more stint where we need Wolf. Yeah. And that could very well happen as well. So I, I'm expecting that Wolf will get at I least one I think he'll get called game. up just because at some point. I think you're going to start to see a few guys get called up just because. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised if we get, especially if they run Markstrom further. I could see him trying to take this team on his back, get them there, and get hurt doing it. Yeah. Oh, and also just to mention before we sign off, um, the Flames did paper two guys down to the minors. Uh, that was Pelte and Coronado. So that um, means they're eligible for the HL playoffs. Yeah, Zari is not, and he'll just remain with the team until the end of the year and go home. I'm I'm kind of surprised, honestly, they didn't uh, wave Gilbert to get him eligible. Yeah, I think that they because of the they amount of young defensemen that are coming in, that, that they needed somebody, basically. I, I think what's going to end up happening is that you'll see a, a defense pair trade out. Like I think the yeah Blahal no I mean I wouldn't stay I wouldn't keep Gilbert down but I'm surprised they didn't paper him down there because then they'll need a defenseman for their run. Yeah, I think that he would have to clear waivers though. And so. I think he would have. Yeah. Who wants Dennis Gilbert? Us apparently. Well, maybe. Yeah, I I think he's good enough for this year, but I can't see anybody taking him at, on deadline day. No. So I was kind of surprised that deal wasn't or that move wasn't made. True enough. I mean, even Osterley, I would have probably put both of them on waivers. You can bring them back up, but at least then they're eligible to go down to the American League. True. But that's why you and I are the GM, Matt. Yep. We'll talk well, to you next week. We'll see how this week uh, turns out. Let's hope it's not a, a, a the slaughter doesn't continue for the Flames. Yep. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.